Okay. So welcome folks and thank you for joining us on yet another Cody Connects webinar. My name is Wendy Craigwin Goche and I am here today to uh, present and to have a conversation about uh, my thinking and about hopefully your thinking about creating communities of practice in digital spaces. And what we're going to do today is really just explore what it is to be a part of a community and to be a part of a community of practice and to be able to understand and to explore what it means to be part of a community of practice and to find that for us. So we're also going to look at uh, communities of practice in digital spaces and think about some of the, the different uh, types of uh, challenges that may, uh, that may emerge being a digital part of a uh, community of practice, but also to think about some of the wonderful opportunities and the best practices that, uh, that have emerged from. So what I'm going to do first is ask you to tell me uh, who is part of today's community of practice? I want you to raise your hand if you think you are part of a community of practice today. Ah, you know what? You have to give yourself more credit. There we go. Cheryl is wonderful. I'm going to raise my hand to be a part of the community of practice. You are. You are part of today's community of practice because you have joined together in interest about a particular topic. So it's how we do things. Fantastic. Excellent. So now what I want you to do is um, identify where in the world you are to participate in your community practice. So at the moment you see a uh, map of the world and at the top of your screen you'll notice that there are some tools for you to use. Um, if you want to grab the pencil you can put a little tick mark or a little circle on where you are located. You can also use the finger <laughs> which is the little pointer and when I hold my mouse you'll notice that it is showing you where I am. So perhaps I am coming in from the continent of Africa. I can be over here. So what I'd like you to do is grab the pencil and tell me, or you can grab the highlight, you, you can grab the, uh, the finger, the laser pointer and highlight on the map where you are as part of the community of practice. Wonderful, I'm seeing some little ticks appear on my tiny little map. At the moment, I know most of us are co-located in one province, so we'll have lots of ticks uh, somewhere in Nova Scotia. Fantastic, we've got an arrow appearing there. So one of the interesting things about being a community of practice, we used to, we used to be limited to communities of, of practice based on geography, where we are located in the world. But today's communities of practice actually are global in nature. And that is because of digital technologies, whether that be uh, simple technologies such as email, listservs, uh, blog postings on the internet, or an actual program of uh, practice where there's a network of community committed people online whether it be a webinar such as this. So what we have done is actually uh, made the world much, much smaller. So today, whoops, I'm going way too fast there. There we go. So if we think about a definition of community of practice, we are a group of people who share a concern or a passion for something that they do. And we want to learn how to do it better. And we also interact regularly in order to do that. So we're brought together for a shared, for a shared understanding, shared passion, but we also improve on our practice as we interact together. And a lot of the information that I'm going to be using today is from Wenger's uh, theory of social learning and the school of thought that surrounds the community of practice. 
And at the end of the PowerPoint slide deck, I have a whole listing of all the references that I have used in this presentation. Now, I want to encourage to uh, have a conversation with me rather than me being just a talking head because it's that shared concern about what we're doing. So let's think about it. Are you in a community of practice and don't even know it? Most of us are actually parts of communities of practice but may not define them as such. <coughs> so what I find is that once we start to think about what a community of practice is, we start to feel an affinity towards that group. So if you think about it, if you have a skill, if you have a role, if you recognize that there's a need that might need to be met within your community, within your organization, within your province or country, how, how have you mobilized yourself and others to address that need? Do you tend to come together in as a like-minded group and with that could be just having lunch that could be just an email listserv that could be a conversation that happens say for example at uh, our most recent uh, inviso at uh, in south africa and importantly though do you see the value in sharing your experiences and skills with others and it's not just that you are an expert or somebody within the group is considered a you know a quote unquote expert it's that all of us have something to share about being together about that particular interest or idea and the fact that we are together means that we can learn from each other. And here at the Cody, that's one of the things that's very important to us is that it's not just the facilitators that come to facilitate learning. It's about the whole process of adult learning principles and being able to gain learning from each other based on your own lived experiences. And that's what the value of a community of practice is, is that it takes all of those, um, all of those learnings, all of those uh, shared experiences, but also the different experiences and validates them and be able to show the comparisons and to share the different perspectives where we all can learn from. And imagine, imagine if we have a community of practice that is not uh, bounded by time or by geography, um, amazing things that we could accomplish. That's what I really want to drill down to at the end of uh, our session today. So I've got a few questions and I'm looking for audience participation here as well. So, my very first question is to you, and I would encourage you to use your microphone. But first question to you is, have you participated in a community of practice before? And what I'm looking for in that answer is a yes or a no. But if you have yes participated, what kind of a community of practice have you participated in? So I'll let you raise your hand. If you'll notice that you're number one in the queue, I'd like you to just uh, tap your microphone, or you can also use the chat feature that's available. So let's share. Have you participated in a community of practice before? Ah, uh, you're way too quiet, folks. Is it? Okay, Aaron, go ahead. So Aaron, if you want to grab the microphone, it's just one click on your audio. Okay, Aaron probably doesn't have a microphone going, if I remember. So she has, Aaron has, participated as a teacher in China. If you have a mic, can you say a little bit about the uh, the things that you did as a teacher in China?
So I'm going to guess based on my conversations with Erin that she has had uh, a community of practice where she met with uh, her fellow teachers and they, ah, exactly, they co-taught and planned curriculum together. Exactly, exactly. Is there anyone else who have participated in a community of practice before? Ashley, how about you? Have you been in a community of practice? I'm gonna start calling people out now. And feel free to grab the mic or to use the chat. Most times we don't think about community organizations as a community of practice. So if you've ever belonged to a, uh, a community organization where you have uh, gathered together for a cause and you have co-learned together. Yep, go ahead, Cheryl. Just grab the mic. So one click will turn on your mic. One click will turn it off. Uh, you haven't got your mic on. So down in the bottom middle. Of. Ah, that's, a, that's actually a really interesting, uh, really interesting um, type of community of practice. So a school of family members of the school to help develop track meet sessions for the middle school. So you're gathered together for a purpose. Exactly. All right. So I'm going to go on to my next question here. What were the common domains? So what were the areas of expertise that you have recognized as part of that curriculum? sorry, as part of that uh, community. What were the things that you brought to that community of practice? Anybody? Ah, so sure. Well, that's fun. <laughs> so actually, if I drop off, <laughs> feel free to jump in. And I do notice that the recording is still happening. Uh, do
All right, Hi. I don't know if folks can hear me, but I'm gonna sub for Wendy here while she figures out whatever <laughs> is happening. Um, so the question is, how would you characterize your participation in the community? Were you on the periphery or a core member? Did your level of participation change over time? So if anyone wants to jump in um, with how their role in that community initiated and then how it may have changed through through their participation. Okay, excellent. Uh, Cheryl mentioned that her uh, area, she was a core member. And so right at the very base. And did you start off as a core member, Cheryl, or did you actually uh, assume the role as you got more comfortable. Ah, so what, do you want to grab your microphone there, Cheryl? Uh, and tell us how your role changed within that community as you got more comfortable. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah, and I think also too, Wendy, as they were able to see some of my skill sets, so some of the other parents were good at like the physical side of the track and, and, and I was more the administrative kind of behind the scenes. So, so I think, yeah, I think in all of that, as we, as we showed our true selves and that's how we, he, we were assigned, whether it be core from the onset or core throughout, me, it was more in the onset, right? Okay, excellent. And you know, that's, that's a really key point because, you know, um, the whole thing about a community of practice, remember, it's all about the learning and being able to, to develop together. And for a community of practice to be flexible enough for people to switch roles, depending on what that task is at the time, and to give that opportunity for people to step up when that skill set is needed. That is very, very key. So, and in the communities of practice, were you able to take the learning from that community of practice and apply it into your own contexts? So anyone at all, was it actually applicable? So you might have met first for one particular reason, but it may have actually um, helped you in another area of your work. One of the things that the research shows is that um, people will learn from a community of practice in terms of organization and in terms of how people uh, communicate and collaborate together. And oftentimes a, uh, a few people might be a member of a community of practice on behalf of an organization or, be, or to be a representative on a board. And uh, as uh, as Erin just noted in the chat, uh, she noted that uh, her community of practice learning was able to be applied to the extracurricular work that she led. So uh, because the students taught English at a local uh, local migrant worker school as well. So you'll notice that the lines for communities of practice are often quite blurred where, um, you know, hopefully there it's such a synergistic uh, uh, opportunity for people to get together that it bleeds in from the professional to the professional to the organization and to the community as well. So when you think about the idea of the theory behind communities of practice and what the theory tells us about certain characteristics it's about the domain. So we've talked about what the share interest that connects the members of the community get together. And each often has a competency or a skill set or knowledge about that particular uh, subject matter that has brought people together. And another characteristic of a community of practice is the community itself. And when you think about community, it's a community has a very loose definition when we're talking about communities of practice because, again, it's that flow in and out. A community is created around the practical idea, around that shared activity that you are pursuing together and it's related to that particular domain. And the whole goal is for you to help each other and to share that information. And then the third crucial characteristic that, uh, from Wenger's uh, theory of community of practice is the actual practice part, where you're actually 
practitioners. The work that you are doing informs your participation in that community. So you have joined in because you have something to share based on your own knowledge, interest, your own Okay, I'm going to turn off my video feed to see if that helps in any way, shape, or form, and to try and muddle through this. Maybe I can get a new computer. Who knows? All right, so let's talk about an online community of practice. So when you think about an online community of practice, um, it is maintained, it's anything that happens using the internet. And we often think about, you know, a course or a class as being together. But what we really are concerned about is being again in this space and in the, in the online space, we want to be able to be able to identify this is who we are and this is what we do, regardless of whether that's a digital space or a physical location. And the whole thing that's bringing you together in an online space is the idea of saying that we are the people that has a shared interest. Now, when we are thinking about successful communities and communities of practice, the, the, uh, the research is telling us that there are certain key characteristics of successful communities and successful communities of practice. So when you think about a community of practice, you've got a very specific cause, a very important goal that people are are, have been brought together and the community of practice itself has to be able to satisfy a particular unique need and it's got to be the reason why it's brought together if the collection of people in that virtual room has not solved a need you cannot say that that community of practice has been successful in a successful community of practice as well it's it has to be a place where people feel free to ask questions, to share their insights, to admit that perhaps that they don't know as much about that, that particular domain as they would like to, but that's why they're a part of the community of practice, is to be able to develop their own understanding. Because the key thing about the community of practice is, is yes, that each of us may know one thing about that particular domain, but when we come together and we start to build all of our conversations, we start to bring our knowledge together and expand it. And the more people we bring in, the more knowledge we can gain as part of our conversations. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of the 99 and one rule of social networking. And uh, this has born true in technology and in community organizations since uh, we've been looking at this, this, uh, this concept since the 1970s. So the 99 and so the 90, the nine and the one rule of social networking means that 99% of the perhaps the 100 that are in the room are people that kind of stand at the periphery. And in the online space, we call them the lurkers. Now, um, I like, instead of using the word lurker, I like to use more the phrase, the interested listener. So it just means that I'm just taking it all in from the periphery. 
that I may do that I may not contribute but I am absorbing all of the information that's happening within that within that social network of uh, of, of the community now when we think about social networking if we think of something like Twitter like Facebook which is just designed as networking and sharing most of us will follow uh, certain particular people on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, but we never actually communicate with them directly. So that would be, that's where we would be part of the 99. But when you think of the nine, 9% 9 of us are casual contributors. So in social networking or social media, when you think of that in terms of Twitter feeds, I might repost something that uh, I might repost something that someone else has mentioned. I might share something about an announcement on Facebook, or in a in an online network of, that's designed for learning, I might contribute to the discussion every once in a while. 1% are heavy contributors. They're always the person in there. They post conversations. They, um, they're they the ones who start off questioning that the 9% will, will communicate and dialogue about. And when we think about those heavy contributors, who are those people that we can convince to move from the one even over to the nine? What do you, you yourselves think that it will take to become even just a casual, um, a casual contributor? What are some of those things? So I'm going to put Ashley on the spot and I'm going to get Ashley to tell me what is it about people's personality or roles that would make Ashley want to be a lurker? As opposed to a heavy contributor or a casual or a casual contributor, <laughs> confidence absolutely for sure. And Aaron also mentioned interest, relevance, and feeling uh, feeling valued absolutely. Um, we can when we are invested in those conversations. And when we feel like it's a relevant conversation, we're more inclined to contribute, to be a part of that 9%. But again, that confidence to be able to put yourself out there is also a key aspect of our, uh, of our contributions. So when we think about social presence, you know, and when we think about the, the interest, the relevance, being valued and confidence, we have to be able to feel that there's an awareness of others in that interaction. And that awareness of others also combined with an appreciation of the others and appreciation of what the interpersonal aspects of that interaction can bring. So what Bates was trying to talk about is, you know, what is it about that, that community engagement that makes me want to be a part of that? And as Aaron and Cheryl and mentioned, is that it is the interest, the relevance, value and confidence. To be able to feel that you are present in the community requires all of that. If not, you will actually be, be one of those 99%, one of those lurkers. So how do we create value within a, a network, within an engaged network of learning? So what uh, connected educators have determined based on some research is that there is a certain amount of value that is brought from being a part of the community. So when you think about distributed leadership, and this is one of the things that I really like, is that distributed leadership means is that it's not always just one person who is taking a lead role within that network. It is shared. And it is shared when people are, are given the opportunity to play a role based on their strengths or be, even based on the aspects of their, of their knowledge that they would like to even grapple more about. So, oh, I want to take on a, more of a leadership role in this, so let me lead this so I can learn along the side. 
And that actually also thinks about the structured activities. So when, we, when you look at things that produce value within a network, people value activities that have a focus, that have a sequence that is moderated and, and actually bounded by time. We are human beings that like to be in little boxes. We like to know that we're contributing to this one particular thing that has a particular outcome and I know how it's going to roll out. I know that there's somebody guiding the process and it has a finite length of time. And you want to also get something out of it as well. What is the tangible product? Why would you want to be able to contribute? What are you taking away from your own experience that you can contribute in your own context as well? It could also, if you think about communities of practice in a, in a volunteer community, it could be that sense of uh, fulfillment, that sense of social justice that you use, but also that shared understanding is also part of that tangible product. But when you think about it as well is what's coming out, people also find value in content and the tools. So when you think about receiving value, you're thinking about having access to quality content, to be able to find information, to be able to interact with uh, people who are like-minded, to be, to be able to network in terms of connections, in terms of finding those movers and shakers as well. Welcome, Eric. Glad to have you here with us participating in our community of practice. So when you think about the value themes that happen uh, in terms of participation, um, this is an interesting concept in terms of uh, in terms of the immediate features. In terms of the oh no worries at all. That's the glory of uh, the glory of webinars and the internet is that you can drop in whenever it works. And that's the whole fun thing about a community of practice as well. People come and go as they can. So this is this again is coming from Wenger and Delat, uh, and um, it, it bears out in online communities. Um, when you think about uh, where online communities in practice, you have to also acknowledge that uh, oftentimes our our interactions are voluntary. We're doing it because something is motivating us to do it. And people in the room, the, the diversity is, uh, is there. So people may not always share the same uh, values or the same opinions and the same life experiences that are brought there. And the activities as well are also, are also diverse. So when people come to these communities, they're coming for different reasons. And to get that engagement for one person may not be what another person gains from that, from that organization. So when you think about that context, you've got to think about the immediate, the potential, the applied, and the realized, and, and the reframing aspects of it. And, you know, this is something that came out of the value of participating in communities and networks. And believe it or not, this is actually rooted back into, into the 1970s from Kirkpatrick's idea of cycles of value. So, you know, these things are bearing out over time. Um, you know, we're, we're almost 50 years in now. And it's also bearing off into space as well. See, so these same things are, are still bearing true in the research on digital aspects. So when you think about immediate value, that's the stuff that happens directly through community activities and interactions. And that's what you get immediately out of it. It's the, oh, I've just joined this. I just got that information I'm going to take away. But the potential value, that is the one that's so hard to measure in a community of practice because you're thinking about, you know, what comes out of that accumulation of knowledge and social capital that happens from that participation. And, you know, the, your value could prove to be useful in the future. And that is that new knowledge that you may not even know how you're going to use yet. 
Um, for me, I love the applied aspect of participation. So you're looking specifically at, you know, actual changes in practice and where the value occurs when people apply what they have learned or developed within the community of practice to their own work. And then they come back to that community and say, hey, I tried this, I did this, and this is how it worked in my context. And then the conversation is like, well, that's kind of cool. And then what did you do? And well, I changed this and I added this. So again, you're creating that dialogue and that more expanded uh, idea of knowledge and a sharing how, how knowledge and understanding works in different contexts. Now, the realized, the realized is what basically the... Um, what many of our government uh, funding agencies or, or philanthropic agencies are looking for is the improvements in performance. So, you know, how can we measure the value of uh, of the community of practice? Well, and that's where, you know, um, where the Cody's work in the learning stories of change have happened where they're trying to capture the uh, the realized value, how people have applied uh, improvements in their individual, in the, in the organization, in the community, or even in the country. Um, and how have you generated new knowledge, new understanding, new wisdom by engaging with those community members? And the reframing, I think, is, is uh, what's really interesting. That's where we get into the idea of transformative learning, is you're changing, it's changes in what is valued as practice, where you have actually either individually or collectively redefined what success means and redefined uh, what your goals are based on new ways of thinking and these are all directly related uh, to a result as a result of the collaboration together in that community of practice. So, you know, and it's the thing is, is that these aren't just linear aspect as well. It does one doesn't happen after another. Um, it, it, it happens very much of a synergistic uh, process as well. They're very strongly inter interrelated as well because if I, for example, if I see that there is evidence of a re of realized value, so let's say I change a particular practice in community-based microfinance, and that might generate an immediate value for somebody else to give them the courage to try something new. So then, so that's how you're you're um, you're moving through those. So um, I just talked a whole lot about stuff. Does anybody find? Um, I'd like you to grab your mic. Uh, is there any thoughts that come about from that concept of participation and value creation? Sure. Uh, the question was, um, you know, based on uh, the things that I just talked about in terms of the value that is created by participation, what are some of the things that that is making you think about right now? About maybe, hmm, I wonder if. Any comments on what Wenger, Trainer, and Delate have said? Okay, not a problem. Okay, Ashley, why do you agree? Based on your knowledge and understanding, perhaps working with, um, perhaps working with the um, um, regional development authorities. And don't forget to grab your mic. Oh, you and your mic, Andy. <laughs> um, you mean that, yeah, through your entire presentation, that's where my mind has been going is, is the time I spent with the regional development authorities. I'm not going to, I can't think of any examples off the top of my head other than I like what they've got 
broken down here on the slide in that you know you've got your immediate um, feedback your immediate uh, connections and then stuff that could come in the future potential you know that you'll lean on them uh, down the road or they may have a question for you or you may be able to help them um, looking at the applied I mean yeah if uh, if somebody's doing what you're trying to do but better um, then you'll probably steal that method and 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 go that way and then it will make for you know a better outcomes for for everybody it'll reinforce the person that you're kind of mimicking and then give you a better way to go about things and then yeah I mean the end with the reframing then then uh, it can it can change the way you see things and the way that you'll do things in the future. We saw that within the RDA and then within the provincial body that was 13 RDAs. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, um, you know, and related to that, Aaron just mentioned in the chat that there seems to be this need for it to have the immediate connection. Um, and that's so true. Communities of practice take time to develop. And when you think about the, the group forming process, the storming, the forming, the norming, or whatever the order of that is, um, it does take time for a community of practice to actually start to gel or to, to, to synthesize together and to become a one, one community because of the competing interests that have brought people to the table. So, you know, as, as Aaron has mentioned, you know, recognizing that there, there's a need for immediate, you know, what am I going to get out of this? What is in this for me or for my organization? But that realization and the reframing is a huge motivation to be able to continue to work together, it's to be able to look at that big picture, to be in it for the long haul as well. Excellent. Okay, now I'm going to slide by this one. So when we think about communities of practice, I want to switch our thinking a little bit to the idea of communities of practice for learning and levels of participation. So a lot of this is based on the idea of uh, the, the theory of social learning itself. And that can be broken down into four quadrants. And when you think about the, the four quadrants, it really links back again into the idea of what we're trying to get out of uh, the connections. So, uh, excuse me, the community itself, the learning as belonging, you know, the very fact that I am brought together for a particular reason to be able to share this knowledge how do I how do I belong to this organization? And then the learning as doing. So what what am I getting out of the actual work that we're doing to be able to innovate and to create knowledge and to create knowledge in our organizations and between organizations? That learning comes from the doing. And there's also the identity the identity aspect of the community of practice to, to actually be able to sit back and say, yes, we have, um, yes, we have this shared collective of like-minded individuals. And, you know, you think back of the idea of having those strength in numbers of being able to say that we are becoming even a movement and you know how do you make social change how do you affect policy that part of that has to do with the becoming the identity and then it's the meaning that is rooted through it the learning that comes from the experience and the learning that comes as the experience throughout that organization so it's very interesting to see where you know have a theory that's built in the 1970s has still aspects today and you think about the me too movement uh, you think about all the different ways that the core group members can bring in people into their active network and then when needed they bring those occasional people that drop in for a very specific reason um, but always on the peripheral there are these people who are taking uh, who are taking note who are who are might uh, change a few things a few ways of their thinking 
So in terms of um, in terms of the levels of participation for uh, design, though, how do we keep all of those concentric circles together? And um, some of the research that's actually been done in Canada, Tony Bates is a uh, is an amazing uh, researcher having to do with communities of practice in the digital age. And I have to admit that I follow just about everything. I'm part of his community of practice in, uh, on his uh, websites and with a lot of his reading. I, I'm one of those nine. I don't contribute very often. A lot of times I, I go to the 99 side of things because he always has some interesting things to say. But um, here at the Cody, one of the things that uh, we have done to create a community of practice, it has been to create something called Cody Connects. And I am going to talk a little bit more about that within context um, after this slide here. But uh, one of the things that, uh, that really guided my thinking and the, the design is how we can actually design an effective community of practice um, in a digital space. And one of the things that we had to identify as well is that it couldn't just be a, it couldn't just be a social network. It had to be a community where people were brought together for the purpose of learning. So remember that the idea of being able to gain knowledge and experience. So when we were thinking about what to bring uh, to that design table, we wanted the members of the community to actually have to play a role in the evolution of the learning, of the learning management that happened. So, you know, in the whole process of trying to identify what to do, we actually had what's called a participatory design process, where we had a model of a network, and we had people in the network and play around with some of the, some of the tools and features, but then we asked them, what do you need? What do you need this community of learning to be for you? And, what, and where do you see yourself in the community of learning or the community of practice down the road? And what was interesting about that is that usually communities of practice uh, kind of serendipitously come together. There's no real formal design, so they tend to be very self-organizing. They often have a, um, a natural life cycle. So they, they begin, they uh, you know, grow in momentum, they plateau, but then they come to an end where they no longer serve the needs of the community. So, but what we're trying to do is figure out how we can actually um, sustain the community of practice. And what it gets down to is some effective key design principles that helps, uh, helps sustain and improve the community of practice. And what it does, it, it relates specifically to how that community of practice is managed. And, but the key thing to remember as well, though, is that Yes, the, uh, the ultimate success of the community of practice is determined by the activities of its members. So, you know, as the CODI is creating the uh, graduate learning network, it's up to the actual members of the graduate learning network itself, the CODI graduates, to help that community evolve. So when we're thinking about how we design for evolution, what we're hoping is that um, this community can evolve and shift in focus to, to meet the needs and the interest of the participants. So if, if a new ID emerges, so for example, um, um, one of the discussion forums in, uh, in Cody Connect's graduate learning node is all about um, you know, how um, ABCD practices can be used in schools. And then there's another one there about, you know, how people have, you know, be wanting to, sorry, there's another one there in terms of um, how people can contribute to the learning stories of change. There's Participedia case studies there. So, you know, how people are contributing to the collection of the body of knowledge. So what that's happening is that we are designing for that evolution. We're trying to make sure that we're responsive to what the community needs, uh, the discussions, the resources to be able to do for them. 
And what that means is that there's a dialogue between uh, the insiders of the community of practice, so the people who are members, but also that there is an outside perspective that's brought in because it's the outside perspective and that's where a lot of the, the research and attending other webinars and, and finding out what's happening in other communities of practice can help inform our own perspectives on the inside. And what that does is also gets us to think about the differences between public and private community spaces as well. So for example, um, most communities of practice that, the, uh, that we found out in the research is that, um, is that a lot of the strength comes from the different levels, the inside and the outside. But what we're looking for is the different levels as well. Um, so if we have, remember that 90, the 9, and the 1, the core active members are the ones who develop who develop regularly, but we want them to come in. Uh, we want to get more of that 1% in there. And that's part of the design and the evolution, but also the public and private spaces as well. Sometimes um, we, we, for example, in Cody Connects, we have the idea that our webinars are public. We put the recordings and the links out there on YouTube where we encourage comment, but the private community spaces within Cody Connects are what's where a lot of that deeper learning happens. And that's where we're actually strengthening the learning uh, of the community of practice itself because we're, it's more of a personal conversation. Um, you can uh, blog about your activities in an online community on Facebook, but in Cody Connects, you can have you can have a smaller group that that you know live within that same context or work in that same field of reference, where you can meet uh, in a discussion forum or even in our, uh, in our our webinar space. So you want to, but really look at what is valued, what is valued within that space, and focus those discussions and activities around those values. So for example, when we're deciding on our webinar content and our discussion forums, those are coming from the participants themselves. They're in response to an expressed need. And it's to get it's to get that familiarity in the in the excitement. So when you're becoming part of a community of practice or community of learning, people want that sense of belonging. So for example, to have Cody Connects as a graduate learning network, what that does is it creates that familiarity of the 6,000 plus Cody graduates who have had a similar experience, and then thinking about what the excitement and the potential of getting together and moving forward. And we're going to see a lot of that happening in terms of our, our future plans of our webinars, where we're actually connecting um, ongoing certificates and diploma classes with the public and also with graduates themselves. And what that's doing is creating a little more excitement and hopefully you know, gaining more members into the Cody graduate team. And again, it's that idea of the rhythm of the community. So people come to expect that there's going to be a webinar once a month or every two weeks, or that there's going to be a lead discussion. So thinking about planning those things as well. When we think about uh, the idea of, um, of the value and how we create the um, how we create the design principles, and I guess I should have changed this slide a little earlier. Uh, whoops! I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, I, I I wanted to talk just a little bit about that design process as well. And you hear me flipping paper here because there's a couple of key questions that you want to ask. Um, what is the community's purpose? Um, what problem is it trying to solve? What opportunities is it intended to take advantage of? And why is this significant? Then you have to ask yourself, uh, who is the core audience? So who needs to be active in that community for it to achieve its purpose? And 
will the focus be on um, you know like-minded or role role alike or is it do you want more of a heterogeneous or more of a diverse group of people for different perspectives when you're coming together would do you want your scope to be local to be regional to be national to be global or is it thematic so for example, here in, in the Cody graduates, we have a number of different uh, learning networks that have emerged. We have our ABCD, which is based on a thematic. We have our women leaders, which is based on a constituent, women around the world. And then we also have our Egypt, which is a geographic region. But as an example of another, we have all Cody graduates. So you'll see that what we've done is created a network where people can, can join all or they can join some. So for example, every Cody graduate is part of our graduate learning network node called Cody Grads. If you're from Egypt and or living in Egypt and you're working in the Egypt uh, context, that's where some of the key design principles has led us to create a geographic node. So that's just an example. Now, one of the things that I'm going to do with our, um, with our system right now is that I am going to share my screen, which hopefully will work. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is actually share a uh, share my screen in terms of Cody Connects itself because I just wanted to give uh, folks a sense of where we are at with um, how we're trying to design the communities of practice in Cody Connects itself. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully it's going to work screen two let's choose screen one i have too many screens here and i'm going to allow and it's going to look horrendous for a second folks you might get a little dizzy <laughs> so what i'm going to do can you give me a uh, ashley can you bump into with the microphone or someone bump in with the microphone and tell me that you are looking at just one screen of cody connects right now yeah it's just the cody connect screen awesome so our cody connects uh website is codyconnects.stfx.ca and again as we're still in the first year of this it takes it a little while to get up and going um, this home page landing page may change a wee bit depending on how we are uh, how we're using how we're responding to feedback from participants so if you do not have a Cody connects login and you do want one please contact us uh, by email at, at uh, Cody connects at stfx.ca you'll find all of that information on each of our webinar uh, advertisements so i'm just going to log in to the cody graduates node and what that is uh, one of the benefits is that the cody graduate learning network uses the same username and password across all of the nodes so what's really nice as well is that any individual user can use their own email and their own password, whatever they choose to allow us to use. So in the Cody Connects Graduate Learning Network, if you are a member of different nodes, you will see them listed at the bottom. So it's just a question of clicking to join over to each one of those nodes. If there is a node that you would like to be a member of, again, uh, let us know and we can add you. Anytime you are in one particular node, all of the information that is shared within that node stays within that node. So they're kind of like rooms, if you can think of uh, rooms in a house. But one of the things that we want to show you through our graduate learning network is that each one of the nodes is very standard in terms of resources, discussions, a user directory, and in our Cody graduates, we actually are, have posted all of the webinars. 
So I'm going to click over to, I'm just going to show a little bit of the left hand side. If I wanted to see who was a member of my, of my uh, node, I could either click on the directory or in the side menu. So I'm going to click on the directory because everybody has that. And you'll notice that everyone who has been added to Cody Connects has actually been added to the graduates node. And you can search by name. And you can also search by alphabet. So say, for example, I go to the K's, it goes to the last name. So I see the fact that there are a number of people in the K's. And I'm going to go to the D. So very quickly, it does change. And hopefully, it's not delaying too much on your screen. So if I wanted to have a convers, if I wanted to send an email to one of these people, all I would have to do is click on email, the email icon, and it would bounce to you, to my own email software. Or I can take that person's email address right here. I can also send an instant message to uh, anybody by clicking on the chat. So it's very immediate that way. Now I'm going to go back to my home. So it's that little picture of a house. And what I want to show you is the resources, which is the little book on the left hand side, or it is the link called resources. Any user can add a resource to Cody Connects, and that's the value. And as they add resources, we can categorize them as well. Right now, you are seeing all the node resources of Cody Connects. Let's say, for example, I was looking for something on the change process. Well, here's a video from Corinne Cash. I'm not going to show you that one because uh, the video itself will uh, will kill the bandwidth. But what I'm going to do is just to click on it because what we've done is given you some back context as well. So we've given you the link and also some information there. Let's say, for example, I wanted to uh, find out about resiliency. Well, here's a webinar that we had uh, almost a month ago on community resilience. So you'll notice that things are cross categorized as well. Case studies are in here. Uh, Julian, uh, one of our Cody, uh, Cody program teaching staff has been involved in a massive project on collecting case studies for Participedia. And he has done uh, some webinars with Cody graduates. And those are located in here as well. Now, what's really interesting is that even though it's a webinar, you can get the case study, you can get a webinar recording, you can get just Peter's section of the webinar, but also you can get the PDF. And you can actually see any PDF before you choose to download it. So folks who are on a, uh, folks who are on different bandwidths can actually read it on screen and decide if they want to, if they want to actually download it or not. So again, very easy to add resources. And if we go to the help node, which is where I'm going to go now, I went home so I could find my Cody help. You'll notice that the resources have how to message other grads, how to change passwords, working with resources, logging in, and creating and adding to a discussion, which is what I want to show next. So just like our chat icon is the same across our social media, our chat icon will also take us to the discussion board. Now, you'll notice that on this, that on this system, because I was in the help node, it took me to the discussion on the help. And we've color coded all of these. So help is red. So if I wanted to go, for example, to the discussion, woo, yikes. If I wanted to go to the discussion that was in uh, the, one second here, accountable democracies node, I would click on that discussion. Now, 
ways to continue learning, introductions and updates, and Accountable Democracy also has Participedia conversations. I'm going to draw, in, as a last little note, I'm going to go back and I'm going to draw your attention to the Cody graduates. This is where most of our discussions that are broader spread across all Cody graduates are actually happening. So for example, if you were interested in the Learning Stories of Change Monitoring and Evaluation Study, there's a specific discussion about that. Where Eric has posted what he wants and Patience has replied. So I'm just going to click in here and it's very, very easy to use. A little bit of background. I'm just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And there, and now Eric, uh, Patience has acknowledged that she's been here and that she's going to give some more feedback. The moment that you come into the node, you can actually give the discussion. So that's kind of a neat way to actually have some deeper conversations. And you'll notice that it is very specific, very community driven in terms of participatory processes. Those of you who are interested in ABCD, um, Brienne has created in the ABCD node, you'll notice that I have to move around. In the ABCD node, her discussions, they had a, a fantastic Imbizo uh, conversation in Port Elizabeth in Africa, South Africa in uh, February. They were hoping to keep the momentum going. And she, she was asking for a discussion group on reflections from the Inviso. So this is a way, again, to continue conversations or even to join in conversations if you would like to be a part of that community of practice. So I'm just going to stop that. Oh, <laughs> share the whiteboard before I make that, uh, make you too dizzy. <laughs> And I'm going to go back to my slide deck. And just as a closing wrap up, before I open up for any questions or comments, I just wanted to bring your attention to uh, an image that I found that to me is a really, really nice summary of uh, online communities of practice where you can start at any location, but let's, let's look at the top and move our way around. So people spontaneously come together under a common theme or joint enterprise and they build trust along, amongst members. And that's what Cheryl mentioned at the very beginning was the idea of that trust and the confidence in order to share tacit knowledge. So things that they know to develop shared practice, which creates collective intelligence, which becomes implicitly held knowledge within each individual member of that community. So to me, that's a really interesting way to summarize the benefits and the values of a digital community of practice in the 21st century. So thank you very much. I am glad that you joined us. And here is proof that I do have all of the references for the resources that I've referred to today. But I'd like to open the floor in our uh, last uh, 15 minutes to any kinds of conversation, any kinds of questions that you have been stimulated to think about in the past hour and 15 minutes. And feel free to grab the microphone. <laughs> Everybody's always so quiet. Yep, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. 
All right, so you're either collecting your thoughts or have nothing to say. So what I'm going to do is uh, just go back to my one slide here. And again, thank you again for your participation. Ah, Erin asks, are there particular challenges in creating an online versus an in-person community of tech practice? Absolutely. It's the idea, the immediacy of time when you're dealing with trying to create a community of practice across time zones and in different geographic locations. And all, um, you know, it's, you know, that idea that you had mentioned before about the immediacy, um, and it's, if it's not in sight as well, if it's not, if it's something that you have to go to, to be physically reminded to check a bookmark or to check an email, or if there's not even an instant messaging system, uh, it's very difficult to stay at the front of somebody's mind. Versus when it's a physical, when it's a physical community of practice, um, you get that visual reminder, maybe you're walking through the hallway or you see a poster. Language as well is another challenge of, of, of uh, communities of practice. Um, how do you communicate language, not just from, you know, the different dialects uh, of uh, even, even French that are spoken across the world, but think about uh, the language that we use within email or even emoticons, um, you know, tone, understanding, you know, we, we seem to assume somebody's tone from an email. If we're writing in capital letters, I'm shouting. All of those things are, are culturally dependent as well. What do we mean by short, crisp answers versus long conversation? Um, the, I find the biggest challenge uh, in creating an online community of practice, though, is the trying to keep at the front of somebody's mind to, re, to actually stimulate that ongoing engagement because we are so tied to our computers to do work, we forget to go to our other communities of practice that are part of it. So one of the suggestions that I've done uh, in the past is actually set up a calendar reminder and say, hey, um, have I, you know, let's spend one hour of my work week exploring what my community, what has happened in my community of practice. Now, the challenge is that um, uh, people will schedule the, the same, you know, oh, I'll do it on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock. Well, no activity happens until everybody logs in at Friday afternoon at three o'clock in their time zone. So my, my, uh, my quest, my challenge for you folks is to, it is for you to, to pick an hour, just a random hour in your work plan or your work day in your organization. When is it typically slower in the ebb and flow? And to give yourself the time and think about it as a professional development of ongoing learning and contributing to that community of practice, both as a user, but also as a participant and a contributor. Challenges, again, it's that momentum for sure. Uh, you, we, we talk about the ebb and flow and scheduling. Things seem to always come up. Does anyone else have any other challenges that they might identify in an online community of practice versus a personal community of practice? I think the biggest thing for me as well is to make sure that there's some kind of an instant messaging system of some sort. We seem to be a very uh, digitally connected society now, regardless of where we are located in the globe. And, and uh, if you're a part of a community of practice that pumps out reminders to either email or instant messaging or an app on your device, that I think is, is crucial to overcome some of the participation challenges. Hopefully that answered your question, Erin. You are very welcome. Are there any other questions or comments? And again, just because we are trying to create a community of practice, there will be a discussion forum in the Cody Graduates uh, Network about creating communities of practice, whether that be 
uh, face to face or whether that be in a digital space across our Cody graduates. And I'm hoping that we can learn best practices from each other because as Aaron noticed, there's probably particular challenges that we haven't even thought about. I'm just thinking, for example, uh, the idea of safety online. And in some of our countries around the world, people cannot share things digitally because of, uh, of uh, certain authoritarian government regimes that uh, tend to uh, control what happens on the internet or, or are engaged in surveillance upon, uh, upon activities. That's actually a conversation that we're going to kind of get into a little bit as well. What are some of the strategies to mitigate those, those fears and risks? Okay. So I'm going to post a um, I'm going to post a web link in our chat box right now. And what that is is a survey for all of our webinar participants to fill out. And what it is, is it's an evaluation of this particular webinar in terms of uh, the value that it has for you, any suggestions for improvement, um, any um, also suggestions for future work that we might do as well. So I encourage each of you to click on that link and give us some feedback. And without further ado, I am going to turn off my recording. And I'm going to once again, thank you for participating in our own digital community of practice about communities of practice. Have a great day.